All right, I'm glad to see all the excitement about storing data sets. Love to see it. Uh, my name is Austin Carson. I'm the founder and president of CDI, which is a nonprofit that I started back uh, near the end of last year for the purpose of building AI resources around the country, especially for communities that are currently underserved. Um, and that means building out compute, building access to data, building out training and educational materials, uh, and creating networks between established research institutions and established companies and startups and others that are trying to build things up. So whenever uh, I talk to Filecoin about one of the main challenges that people are starting to see with artificial intelligence, which is ensuring that we have both the data sets archived and stored to, so we can understand what created the artificial intelligence agent and making sure that they're indexed together. So as they change over time, especially as we get into this environment of continuously retraining big models and specializing and tuning them, uh, so that we can understand not just the trajectory, but be able to have a look back and be able to understand if something falls away, if something strange happens, to be able to do an audit of the system itself. Um, I kind of have this visual. I assume that in this, it's fine, guys. You can talk. I don't even care. OK, Rachel cares. Yeah, everybody should do what Rachel says, always. Thanks, guys. Um, but I imagine this room is one where there are a lot of people that read XKCD comics. And there's an old great one with somebody having like these kind of stacked blocks. You know, and it's like, here's all modern digital infrastructure, and it points to one Jenga block, and it's like, this has been maintained thanklessly by a guy in Nebraska since 2003. Uh, and artificial intelligence is about to become the new software, right? And it's just like how software is today. There are going to be a lot of dependencies. There are going to be a lot of things that ultimately can interact in a, in a harmful way. And so if you look at cybersecurity today, a lot of the things that we see are you know, gaps in implementation, problems with systems that are interacting, sometimes component-based, sometimes proprietary, uh, that open up attack surface. And so with artificial intelligence, not only do we have new types of attack surface, new types of adversarial programs, um, but you also have the level of abstraction in how these systems work, right? And so on one hand, you know you have a much higher level of efficiency for a given task, or you have a certain ability to generate language or generate images. Um, but there rises an environment in which a bunch of weird stuff happens, right? Like if you've been following GPT-3, which is one of the most sophisticated kind of large language models, uh, you know that depending on how you ask it things, depending on what you do, you're prompting pretty much this fuzzy probability model of all the text in the internet, really. I mean, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but like a lot of the text of the internet, 45 terabytes of text scraped from a bunch of different public sources, 22 separate public data sets, and you can pull anything out of that ultimately. Now, these are generally designed so that you can't prompt for specific person's information, right? It's not like they carry these records of that. But you do pull out weird amalgamations of, of people's things. There's all these like hallucinations that happen with these algorithms, um, which is especially important because they're general systems, right? Like we've been talking for a long time. I'm sure you read the news, be like, nah, AI is not what you think. You know, it just kind of does one specific thing. We don't have general AI. One day that'll happen and we'll have Terminator. Well, the fact is we do now, which is really, really fucking crazy. Sorry, I don't know what the rules are. And nobody has really acknowledged that fact, which has been mind boggling to me, right? Like we have systems that can be applied to, again, originally process, designed to process the next word in a sentence, the most probable next word in a sentence that they suddenly realized could draft entire long form things. And as of last year, it had already generated 6.5 billion words on the internet, right? Which is just like, um, and there's two things here. The first is, as soon as that happened, people discovered there were a bunch of other emergent capabilities from the system, one of which was being able to code, another of which was being able to be adapted with images, to do image generation, same type of, it's called a transformer network, which is, you can pour a ton of data into it that's in a more unstructured way, and it like assembles into a large, sophisticated, massively abstract system, right? Um, and so the second thing is that you can retrain it, right? You can, you can specialize it for a certain purpose. And one of the past challenges with AI is we didn't have millions of labeled examples of something with a high certainty that what you had labeled was accurate and that the variables you had isolated for or the way that you had formed the inquiry was accurate. Um, then that would be a failure point, right? And now we're coming, into a, we're coming into a little bit of a different space where, 
Again, it's a massive, massive system that will underlie everything, right? And something you can look forward to is there's going to be a natural language layer under pretty much every application, right? It's going to be increasingly important to be able to naturally communicate with all types of different systems. Uh, and I don't know if you saw recently, but Reid Hoffman and one of the co-founders of DeepMind, I think, just started a new uh, organization called Inflection, I believe, which is designed to con like further increase the ability for people to communicate naturally with artificial intelligences. Um, and so you're going to see that everywhere. Just like in your phone right now, in your Google Home, you're already talking to it to make it do stuff. It's going to get increasingly sophisticated over time and increasingly capable of doing more. Again, you're going to limit the reach of it, but more multi-stage tasks, right? Um, so looking at you know, where is that data stored right now, where does that data come from that creates these artificial intelligence systems, because again, they are largely a representation of the data that they are composed of or that trains them. Now there are you know, wrinkles to this, but as a general matter, if there's more data, you're going to have a more robust system. Uh, data, again, has to be sophisticated, it has to be properly vetted, you have to have a pretty good sense of where it's come from, et cetera. But as a general matter, that's the case. Now, a lot of people are working right now to decrease the, nece like the necessary data. But one of the least data intensive things you can do right now is retrain one of these super sophisticated general networks into a more specialized version, right? And so those data sets are the ones that aren't really being captured. I was at the uh, Chamber of Commerce. US Chamber of Commerce is doing kind of a standalone side AI commission to supplement the other ones that are traveling around the country, trying to do it more, I think, in a regionalized sense. And so I went and testified in front of them, and I made this point, actually, and gave Filecoin the little credit. I was like, working with Filecoin to figure this out. Um, and, uh, and I was actually pretty pleased to have my, what feels like a more uh, less scientifically founded opinion of the importance of this, <laughs> echoed by the professor at the University of Texas who runs their Institute for Fundamental Machine Learning Research, one of the NSF AI institutes. And he raised it and said it even better than I did, which is, you know, in my thought, it was more like you're going to have one level of training, retraining, and then there's going to be marketplaces of those retrained networks where, like, if you want to get one that's really good at, there are already services for, like, copywriting or for writing narratives or something. But again, what we're getting to right now is multiple retrainings. And that's what he was saying. He was like, you know, you may have not GPT-3 necessarily, but, you know, one of the other either publicly available large language models or something that you then retrain to specialize for a task. Well, then somebody else is going to take that pre-trained model that they got on a marketplace and then retrain it again to further refine that model. And as it becomes easier and easier to do that, like right now I know a lot of startups that are working on pretty much a drag and drop AI uh, transfer learning, where like you'll open it up, it'll have the general system and you'll just drag your data center or your data set and drop it in there and it'll generate out slightly more sophisticated for your use case. But again, whatever one works best for this task, people are going to start using as their own kind of, again, it's like you're on, you're on GitHub and there's the best open source thing for whatever and everybody starts using it. Maybe there's forks off of it or whatever, but depending on the license. Um, it's going to be the exact same thing for artificial intelligence, except for each of those things is going to be iterated upon, I mean, again, depending on licensing, but unlike the other software, it's not like you have copyright on the trained model. Right? Like you have some ownership of it, but it's not like you have, you know, people are unable to retrain it if you make the model itself available. Right? And it's an interesting thing to think about. You're going to have cascading lost data sets kind of throughout the way. And the only way that you can audit and be certain of why algorithms are doing something is by auditing how those data sets work and then seeing how it affects different weights. That's where a lot of explainable AI is coming from right now, being able to trace something moving through the neural network and reweight and see what happens. Um, and so again, Filecoin is doing some incredible stuff on this. You know, there are a lot of different hosted public data sets. There is a lot of work being, doing, being done on this for the purpose of different academic institutions. The US government has data.gov, and they're working proactively to expand the number of available data sets, a number of universities. Private companies will put out data sets that they think are generally valuable. And again, these are all hosted on their own servers or hosted on AWS, and there's, of course, redundancy in those things. Uh, but one thing that we need to make sure of is that, A, they are preserved, right? There are easy scenarios you could imagine where somebody makes that thing on GitHub that's everybody's favorite service, and then they have their data set, but maybe it gets stripped off for some reason, or any kind of number of things could happen. And the people that do the following force are probably not going to preserve their own stuff because they're not the original creator of the thing, right? So making sure you have that archive and also making sure you have distributed access to that information is very important. Um, and again, as we've seen over and over again, 
lack of redundancy or a lack of, you know, uh, freedom from the whims of certain types of industries and people that might want to sue to take things off the internet, as you probably heard about a little earlier. Uh, it's nice to have those things distributed and not have a single point of failure. So the Slingshot program has been huge. It's been amazing to see Filecoin load up these hard drives. Well, actually, this is on in taking data sets, right, and having these competitions for you know, who can, you know, who has data sets to put forward? You know, how do you store them? How do you make them most usable? It's exciting because they're, they're doing something that we had originally discussed, which is, I don't know, I don't, I'm not the guy that, re, you know, knows every currently developed model, but when you work with the expert network, when you work with the community, that's how you actually learn what is most valuable to store. So I appreciate that approach. It is a fundamental approach of CDAI itself. I mean, it, again, it comes from the, you know, I used to work on the Hill and there's a certain, deep hubris known to be associated with congressional staff and pretty much all like high level 27 year old government officials, you know? Uh, and it's been nice to leave and work at NVIDIA and work with a bunch of way smarter people and get repeatedly humbled again and again and again until you get to the point where you're like, well now I know a lot more than the average Hill staffer, but holy shit, that is not that much apparently. And I kid, like I do know some of the smartest, like hardest working doing a bunch of research people, but most people are just trying to deal with whatever their district is doing, right? And so coming out of that perceived knowledge base and learning about where it is, I cannot overexpress the importance of the people that are in the crowd here today that are doing a lot of work to understand like what's happening in the industry, how can you contribute to it, how can you link together to do some kind of good work. Um, and I think it's awesome that Slingshot's contributing to that. Another Filecoin Discover as well, which is what I briefly alluded to, preloading hard drives, sending them to people across the country, making sure you have multiple uh, like multiple different iterations of these that can be accessed, super important. The one thing that I would like to see from here um, that we have been discussing and I've talked to some other startup friends of mine who do similar work um, is making something really easy where it's just a simple plugin. If you are in any place where you're uploading your pre-trained model, you just access, you know, click this thing, takes your data set, stores it in, again, Filecoin or wherever else makes sense. They handle this indexing and so over time you develop this naturally indexed uh, naturally indexed system that can be queried. So, I mean, there is a lot of work to be done on every aspect of pretty much artificial intelligence and Web3 and quantum computing and, and, and. Um, but I'm happy to have found good partners um, around the country doing a lot of different things, but especially in Filecoin. And it's like, you know, it's the willingness to figure out something good to do, right? It's not incredibly obvious how you should leverage Web3 for the purpose of furthering like public good with artificial intelligence. Right, but it's making that effort and figuring it out that lets us start the train and then you know, as time goes on, it'd be incredible if there was this maintained for incredibly low price, especially because these data sets are not gonna be regularly accessed if they're for the pre-trained model, the pre-trained model, the pre-trained, or the retrained model, the pre-trained model, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so that makes those types of storage very efficient. And I think that it is nice to be able to do that and then have the support of a community that also has a passion, almost like ideological interest in preserving that information. Um, so that's the long and short of it. I'll leave one last point that I like to make to everybody all the time, which is that everything is getting fucking insane right now with artificial intelligence. Like I cannot overexpress to you the acceleration of research and technological development. Like we went from, you know, GPT-2, which came out a couple years ago. People were like, oh, maybe it's disinformation, but the writing was like really unsophisticated and really easy to tell if it was or not, um, to GPT-3, which is a very functional system, to then like every other company put out some equitable system to GPT-3 over the next six months instead of two years, right? They realized it could code and make no-code systems. Everybody put out a no-code system over a three-month period of time, right? Then we get into this space of What's the next thing? Okay, multimodal, like one model to rule them all. Google just put out this multimodal model where you can just have the one system that does audio and video and text, which means that if that's happening every three months, which was happening every six months and eight months and a year, it's getting really wild. And it's getting that way in a sense that people thought was literally impossible two to three years ago. And again, it's something that's deeply lost. It was thought to be 50 years out, you know? I mean, again, some of that projection was based on the idea of conscious AI, which is like, I'm not gonna get into that. But um, unless you guys want me to, I'm happy to. But, uh, you know, I still, it's a general AI system getting increasingly general, right? That means the world's changed. The world has now changed forever and we are in this like simple matter of time until there's an auto-productive system, right? And I think, 
people may have an issue with that, but I'd be surprised if you talked to him for like two minutes. It's just literally making access to a couple different things. And you guys may remember it, uh, a Google show a couple years ago, they demoed Duo, which is pretty much you would ask Google, like, hey, make a reservation at this restaurant. It would call them, make the reservation for you, do a random other thing or two, and send it back. Now, having access to outside capabilities is certainly something that makes people concerned about a system. The ability to let it like drive a car somewhere and pick something up for you and bring it back and then like call somebody. You know, the more steps there are, the more it gets a little dicey. But it's coming. It's happening. Right? And we have to be prepared for it. And being prepared for it means that all of those components that are going to be involved in all of those systems, just like technology and software today is open source or is, you know, component based or whatever, that's going to continue. AI is going to be all software that doesn't have to be deterministic. It doesn't have to have like a chain because we have to be able to know exactly how it works, right? Um, so keep, keep your eyes on it, it's nuts. So if you are really interested in artificial intelligence, I have one recommendation, I say it at every panel, and I'm sorry, I'm like his biggest fanboy. Um, but one of my board members, Jack Clark, who used to work at OpenAI and now is one of the co-founders of an organization called Anthropic, which is also, yeah, you know, they're making, working on the same kind of large language model stuff as OpenAI, which is who made GPT-3. But they're also working really hard on an AI assurance ecosystem. It's like, how do we make the tools with these large abstract machines that, again, are somewhat alien to us to understand what the harm vector is, right? To understand what are the negative outcomes. Um, he has a great newsletter. If you go to jack-clark.net, he's not paying me for this. Um, <laughs> Because if he was, I would have been like, dog, get .com, .net. What is it, like 1997? <laughs> Fuck. Uh, I hope he's not watching. Anyway, so he has a newsletter called Import AI, and it is easily the best resource. Somebody that spends a lot, like, their entire time trying to read about AI, like kind of broad external development, and try to read and learn about like kind of cutting edge AI research, I would not have been able to talk about any of this stuff if I didn't read this pretty religiously. So comes out every Monday, read it, it's wild, it'll make you crazy like I am, and like, ah, uh, but that's, that's where we are, and it's good to know about. And there is eventually gonna be more relevance to Web3. Like right now, we do have problems with distributed computing and with the idea of like using, you know, it's not efficient at the moment to use most kind of distributed decentralized technology for training in artificial intelligence or even bringing information in for federated learning. I think those are gonna be huge opportunities. I think they're gonna be opportunities with artificial intelligence on the blockchain itself and understanding information, understanding smart contracts and forming new types of technology. And this goes to that automatic productivity. So anyways, look, I'm going on. I could do this for like 30 more minutes, even though I told Rachel, I'm like, oh, I don't know, it's a 15 minutes of free associating. How could I do it? So I don't know if we have time for one question, but I'll take one question if we do. Shoot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kill right. Creator of the system, ultimate creator of the system. Because it's on them to ensure that as they bring in all the different information that they validate it. It's like I used to work at a video, right? And when they would take, when they would, before they would release a trained like autonomous vehicle model, which is one of the things, again, I'm sure you all know NVIDIA, you may not know that they've just developed an entire stack for autonomous vehicles that you can just build on top of slightly in any, v you know, it's kind of wild. But anyways, before they would do that, they would, they would simulate billions of driven miles, right? And those simulators themselves are getting more and more effective, and when they collect the data sets, they have better and better kind of best practices, whatever. But it remains on whoever provides the service in the end as a general matter. Now, I mean, litigation, you can see all the way down the chain of commerce, and maybe somebody will decide that whoever provided some data is in the chain of commerce, but that, I, I can't imagine that being the case, especially because most of these data sets are public are either publicly available or their data that was collected from driving around or from some other kind of manual sense. And so if that's the case, then it's gonna play into the ultimate technology person, right? But those, those questions are like gonna be solved through litigation, right? I mean, gonna be solved through litigation inevitably and then assuming something weird happens, then Congress will like be forced to take it up and it'll take them three to four years to do something about it at an absolute optimistic rate. And by then the fundamental state of technology will have yet again changed. So. I mean, that's another thing to be really mindful of right now. It's gonna be hard to keep up with this stuff. 
Yeah. No, we can talk downstairs if you guys are interested, which thank you for being interested. I feel like I started out like archiving. But listen, I really appreciate you all paying attention. Um, it's been fun to be here, and I'm happy to talk downstairs. <laughs>